Okay, welcome, I'm Kaya, and welcome everybody to the Archaeology Seminar Series um, at UWA. And I'd like to start by acknowledging that we're standing today on Raja Puja uh, and pay my respect to the Noongar people who are the traditional owners of this land uh, and to their elders and ancestors. Um, and also, uh, please note the subliminal messages on the slide. Um, next. If I, yes, that's always an issue. Okay, um, so we are now in the third talk for our seminar series, and we still have a number of them coming up, as you can see. Um, we've had two uh, new talks just recently confirmed, um, new approach to dating World Yoga's rock art next week. Uh, and then we also have um, an archaeobotanical perspective to some aspect of the dark MU uh, debate, actually. So that's going to be interesting. Uh, and also just note that um, the early history of the opium poppy with our guest speaker from the Museum d'Histoire Naturelle in Paris has been rescheduled for 23rd of September. And there might be a few more talks, so just um, keep an eye out on the social media and all of this other um, way to follow. Uh, just a note for people in the room and on Zoom that uh, we are recording this seminar and we might or might not share it on our YouTube channel or with people who missed the seminar. So just be careful um, about what you say. Uh, so the chat that you're sending people on Zoom, uh, even if you think it's a private message, it's actually showing here. Okay, so just be careful. Um, and now I can actually introduce our speakers today, uh, Laura Meyer and Martin Poor, uh, who are going to talk to us about um, um, cave, rock cave, um, replicated, I'm losing my word, replicated temporality. Uh, and in terms specifically of rock art replicas, uh, talking about the, some French caves. So that's going to be interesting. Um, and I'm going to do an actual formal introduction of the speakers. Um, so Laura Mayer is Associate Fellow um, at the School of Cultural and Communication at the University of Melbourne. And she recently completed her PhD in archaeology at UWA with us, focusing on the visitor experience of uh, the immersive rock art replicas Lascaux de and Chauvet de in France. And her research interests include authenticity, cultural tourism, and archaeology in popular culture. But she's not able to join us, maybe online, but looks unlikely at the moment. So Martin is going to do all the show by himself. Um, Martin Poor is Associate Professor of Archaeology at UWA and a member of the Center for Rock Art Research and Management here. And his research expertise lies in European Paleolithic art and archaeology, Aboriginal art and rock art um, of Northwest Australia, uh, the, relevant, the relevance of postcolonial approaches to archaeology and um, in rock art research. So, for you now, yeah, are you happy with my next slide? Well, you, you struggle with so many things. There. Yes, I can't say everything about you, Martin. There's too much, too much to say. Um, so, I will share Martin for a point now. Where are you here? Here we go. So it's sharing. Yes, thanks, Ola. Uh, Emily. Hopefully, um, people can hear me. Um, and somebody can keep track if people can hear me. Or do we see messages when they're coming through? Uh, so, anyway. Um, okay, so I'm just trying to position myself that I look at the same time as people in the room and at the camera. Um, so, um, I also want to start with the acknowledgement of country that we are on unceded Nungawajuk land and that they remain the spiritual and cultural custodians of this um, country. So, thanks a lot, Emily, for the introduction. Um, today, um, we're going to talk um, about uh, you know, replicate, we call it replicated temporality, time, originality, and rock art replicas. Uh, and as um, Emily was um, just mentioning, um, that Laura, who, as you can see, is officially the first author of this paper, um, had to pull out um, at very short notice because um, she uh, was uh, lucky, or not lucky, I mean, uh, was very well deserved that she recently got an appointment, uh, the research assistant at the ANU uh, in the School of Heritage and Museum Service. Well, she's going to kill me. Um, mm -hmm. and she's, but she's starting on the 1st of September 
Uh, and um, so which is great and not so great is, as you might have noticed, the complete disaster that is unfolding uh, actually in the Eastern States. So she is now desperately trying to organize her move from Southern Queensland into the ACT. And as you can imagine, that is proving a big um, um, challenge. And so that's why um, I will um, uh, present here all by myself. And uh, which is a bit of a shame because, of course, a large part of that um, presentation. Should we maybe switch off this? Are these? What happens if I push these ones here? Okay. Um, so um, it's uh, related also to her PhD um, research. And so we collaborated on this. Um, so the other thing is what I just want to say is that um, the uh, the talk is a um, is a very condensed version of a book chapter um, that we've been writing together, and uh, so you have to wait a little bit for the longer version um, if you're interested in that. And yes, it has gone through peer review already. So if you think it is really bad, tough, you know, so we have, it will be it will be published. Um, so anyway, well that's, um, you know, a little bit of that. So this is the situation and as I said, um, I hope I can answer some of the um, questions, but especially related to her original research on the experience of rock art replicas in Chauvet, do we have to say two or the you know, Chauvet, Chauvet two? Um, and uh, Lasco two, um, that uh, is of course her work and that's, I think that's going to be quite clear. Okay. Deep time archaeology has its origin in the 19th century and was integral to the establishment and widespread acceptance of humanity's antiquity. It contributed to the appreciation of the depth and complexity of Earth antiquity and past changes in geography, climate, animals, uh, and plant communities, and so on. In the absence of radiometric dating methods, absolute age was estimated by the depth of stratigraphies and the perceived crudeness of man-made artifacts and the association between artifacts and the remains of exotic, non-endemic or extinct animal species. One of the defining features of deep time archaeology is the focus on the origins of phenomena that are regarded as constitutional for the present or the human condition in general. Gamble and Gittins, for example, have criticized that because of this orientation, approaches towards the deep time evidence tend to be selective and limited and are often ignorant towards the possibilities of understanding the breadth of complexity of the deep human past. While academic assessments about the deep origins of art have more recently moved towards Africa and Asia, European Paleolithic art is generally still presented and perceived to be linked to the global origins of artistic human capacities particularly in public discourses. The Eurocentric heritage of the early phases of the re research history remains influential. And more importantly, within this understanding, the painted caves are understood as nodes and locations where a phenomenon, for example, art, originated that has a direct connection with the presence and every human being. In this way, they participate in humanity's essence. This understanding can be linked to the Western view of the temporality of humanity itself, which views the human as consisting of layers of global evolutionary historical development. The essence of humanity, its core, can move unaffected through time and a wide range of um, material expressions. Temporal depth acquires dimension of significance, purity and authority and wholeness, which connects to the unbroken fascination with origins in archaeology and in the Western imagination in general. In the discussion of heritage, we want to argue, therefore, that in the context of deep time archaeology and Paleolithic cave art, the notion of authenticity needs to be understood within a framework of originality, drawing attention to the importance of temporal depth in this context and the importance of origin narratives. And I just realized that I'm um, here maybe not getting in trouble with the French colleagues, but also with my German colleagues. Um, because this is, this is what, what, what I found we're more familiar with um, from Southwest Germany, you maybe know this, and uh, so it's interesting. I mean, this is a German actually word creation, the Welt Ursprung, but basically it's presented the art, the standard origination art, um, as you know, that I'm quite familiar with, with the word origin of culture that uh, feeds into this, this idea. Um, this is the end you see. Some of the website um, of the, you know, of, of the, because it was nominated, it became UNESCO World Heritage not too long ago. Authenticity, 
Authenticity remains an equally controversial and key concept in the study and assessment of heritage. The term is currently foremost understood in a relational way and authenticity is regarded as an emergent feature of emotional and perceptual engagement. Observers negotiate their understandings of authenticity in relation to certain material properties, such as patina, damage, material decay. Holtdorf has described these characteristics in objects as reflections of pastness. These are based on assumptions and orientations that observers, visitors, or consumers bring to these engagements and allow the establishment of relationships between themselves and the deep past. While ideas of authenticity in the context of heritage have diversified considerably, we want to hypothesize that in the Western context, the element of authenticity experience of originality remains particularly strong, and especially in the context of deep time archaeology and Paleolithic cave art. <clears throat> in this paper, we understand replicas as consciously created to replicate other original objects as faithfully as possible, but also as exact three-dimensional copies at full scale. Here's an example from the Chauvet um, cave replica. Um, replicas are a type of heritage interpretation that are designed to transmit public values, significance, and meanings of a heritage site, object, or tradition. Replicas are a regular occurrence in a wide range of contexts across cultural landscapes and institutions. They are an established aspect of museums where they can be displayed in exhibitions or simply being sold in the museum shop. Replicas need to be distinguished from fakes, which are created and displayed or used deceptively. As such, fakes have been produced to create a false sense of authenticity and have been erroneously acquired at auctions, have had entire exhibitions built around them. The distinction between fakes and replicas is a crucial one, but the difference between these two categories does not reside in the object themselves, in the objects themselves. Um, the, it's not the, mat the material quality, but in the social context, emotional engagement or circumstances and the motivations surrounding the creation and the use of the respective object. A replica, therefore, can become a fake during its lifetime and vice versa. Replicas gain their authenticity in the same way that original objects gain their authenticity through social and relational processes of emotional and perceptual engagement. However, in the case of replicas, these processes depend on the recognition and the appreciation of the authenticity of the object that is replicated. The viewer can simultaneously marvel at the technical brilliance and artistic quality of the replica that was created as well as the deep time dimensions, where technical brilliance and artistic qualities might also be a factor. The material aspects of the replica are secondary in this respect because they might or might not involve the same types of materials as in the original object. In temporal terms, the replica exists within two temporalities simultaneously, and the viewer's engagement might oscillate between the two. In the first instance, the viewer is fascinated by the faithful replication of a deep time object in the present. In the second instance, the viewer appreciates past human actions and abilities and the link to significant past phenomena, such as the past, um, past create creative capacities or the origins of art. In the latter, temporality is especially negotiated with reference to radiometric dating results. In 1951, the first radiometric age determination for Paleolithic cave art was published. The age 15,516 plus minus 900 BP was obtained from a sample of charcoal that was taken from the occupation level in the shaft of the last four cave. In 1958 and 1959, samples of charcoal from the passageway and shelf produced additional age determinations around 17,000 and 16,000 uh, years, respectively. Beginning in the late 1980s, the development of the AMS techniques in radiocarbon dating was transformative for rock art studies because it allowed organic samples as small as one milligram to be obtained from paintings uh, and dated as well. It was quickly applied to Paleolithic 
cave art, for example, at the sites of Lyon, Altamira, and El Castillo. AMS dating was also used to produce the initial date for Chauvet Cave, which measured to 30,940 BP, 30,790 for two rhinoceros, and 30,430 uh, for a bison depiction. AMS radiocarbon determinations have served as a bedrock for comprehensive dating programs at Chauvet Cave and have been employed alongside uranium thorium mass stepo spectrophony to determine ages of charcoal, bone, and calcite. Both dating techniques have been instrumental in determining two periods of human activity within Chauvet Cave, dating from 37,000 to 33,000 BP and 31,000 to 28,000. BP. Radiometric dating techniques allow the translation of physical and material properties that exist in the present into past processes. They are fundamentally interpretative processes of inference and extrapolation. Radiometric dating techniques appear as the ultimate way of validating the idea that an object or a structure belongs to the past or a different time. However, all objects that are dated exist in the present. They are not frozen in time. They have not remained unchanged. Consequently, the replica exists as much in the present as the original object. They both gain significance through the above mentioned processes of interpolation and inference. The antiquity or pastness of the original object is as much as an illusion as the antiquity or pastness of the replica. They both exist in the present and participate in the unstable and socially constructed temporalities of authenticity and originality. All of the aspects discussed so far come together in an enhanced form in the visitor experience of the immersive replicated rock art sites Lascaux 2 and Chauvet Cave should be no, in Shoei Cave 2. Both sites entirely surround the visitor in a fabricated environment, removing them from the outside world. Both sites encourage an appreciation of the accuracy of the replication and the sites that are replicated. Both sites inspire imagination, wonder, and belief. To truly understand how these ideas are created for visitors, it is important to remember that the term visitor experience is related to each person's immediate or ongoing subjective and personal response to an activity, setting, or event outside of their usual environment. It is a personal subject to change, immediate yet continual. It is not, as is once described, the result of a transmission sent by an organization and passively received by an individual. It is constructed and framed by a personal context, a socio-cultural context, and a physical context. Chauvet II cave is in its, and its original are located in the Ardèche region of southwest, southeast France, excuse me. Chauvet cave is situated in the side of a limestone cliff overlooking Ardèche River and the natural nearby archway known as the Pont d'Arc. It contains over 1,000 graphic representations, including 425 animal figures, in addition to thousands of animal skeletal remains, trails of animal and human footprints, combustion structures, and flint artifacts. In 2014, Chauvet Cave was inscribed into the World Heritage List. Soon after the cave was discovered in 1994, the decision was made to never open the site to the public and instead satisfy visitor demand and interest through the creation of a replica. The result is Chauvet Cave 2, a sprawling complex consisting of a welcome center, gift shop, on-site museum, the so-called origination gallery or Galerie de l'Orignation. God. <laughs> the restaurant, a restaurant, event space, paleolithic camp, and replica. 
It is situated just two kilometers from Chauvet Cave on the Razal Plateau, a densely wooded area of about 29 hectares overlooking the town of ballon en -Darc. The replica is housed in an enormous round gray concrete building that is engraved with patterns created by scanning um, Chauvet Cave. And of course, I'm in here in this position that I actually have never been there. Um, so, but I think, Peter, have you have been? Yeah. Yeah, so maybe you should uh, continue from here. <laughs> but, um, but uh, yeah, so I, unfortunately, I haven't had a chance um, um, to be there. And that is, of course, where Laura did her um, large part of her PhD research. So, um, so that's, why, that's why about 80% of the presentation was planned that she would give it. Um, so, but anyway. Um, so let's see. But anyway, so um, yes, Chauvet 2, this is actually quite an interesting aspect. Um, condenses, so Chauvet 2, excuse me, condenses the original cave from 8,400 square meters to 3,000 square meters and reproduces 82 sections of the site's archaeological and geological features. And uh, so actually, I don't want to say that much about this, but it's in, in terms of, um, it's actually a point that, that Laura and I have been discussing. So um, one of the reviewers, and I think it was Oscar, more of idea, so I know also, I know Oscar. <laughs> he, he suggested that we're, it's all very well to talk about the temporal aspect, and that's, that's all good, but what about the spatial one? And, uh, and of course, in fact, these are, and that's fair enough, intertwined. Um, and so what is then the experience of actually the, um, the, the actual cave and also how you move through the space because there's always you know, the, the, the temporal aspect in there as well. So when it is so condensed, you know, so what are the, the decisions that are in there also in spatial terms, but then we said, oh, we can't actually address that. Um, and it's, it's really a whole um, a further point um, to discuss, but I still think this is um, quite um, something that um, needs to be taken into account uh, when it talks about the, the replica, so the spatial aspect, but we are will not be able uh, to talk about that. And that's what we, we will say, Oscar, um, just in terms of that we can't address that. So anyway, <laughs> or maybe it wasn't Oscar anyway. So, um, so here's, uh, here's some just image from Jill. Um, to actually um, do the actual, you know, replica, and is it, is it, so to speak, not in any way. Um, um, so, so the surface is uh, computer generated, and so, but actually the painting is completely, so to speak, um, um, craft work, you know, by one of the masters of, um, you know, Paleolithic art research in 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 in, in the world in, in France, um, and so, and I also want to thank him. So, some of the photos. I think this one as well, but I'm not 100 sure. Is actually that he actually sent to us to use in the book chapter, so they are in here as well. And that's why I haven't actually discussed it. So that's why I said, no, do we? No, no. If we can actually show it uh, in later on YouTube, and uh, and of course, I don't know if you've seen any of these images, but um, this is actually how it was built, the actual one, so that when the whole um, cave was scanned and then put together, uh, and so it's really. Very, very impressive um, from, the, from the technical point of view. Through a combination of scanning and modeling, casting and hand painting, the replica is within millimeter accuracy of the original Chauvet cave. So visitors uh, to Chauvet 2 cave typically attend the site for three hours, so the whole complex. During this time, visitors move through the grounds on a network of dry gravel paths that connect the buildings with one another. Five information shelters present visitors with information on both the Chauvet cave and the replica. One shelter, for example, details the dating activities at the Chauvet cave and states that both dating and stylistic features of the cave paintings allow us to assign them to the origination culture that is the first Homo sapiens culture known in Europe. This message is reinforced in the Orignation Gallery, where five reconstructed human figures depict the daily life of Orignation families and the activities of the artists. The replicas of Orignation mobility art from southwest Germany are uh, also included. Yet it is the paintings inside the replica that most visitors are eager to see. The only way to see the paintings is through a guided tour of the replica. 
In the summer season, guided tours occur every six minutes in groups of about 25 visitors. Visitors meet their tour guide outside of the replica to collect their headsets, which allow them to hear the narration of the guide throughout their tour. Moving down an enclosed concrete ramp and waiting at the set of double doors, visitors are instructed not to take photos or videos, not to touch the replica, and to turn off their mobile devices. With the anticipation building, visitors listen intently as the guide says softly, I'm going to take you back a bit in time. It's the 18th. <laughs> it's the 18th of December 1994, before describing how the Chauvet cave was discovered and the reasoning behind the site's permanent closure. And this is where the illusion begins. The double door opens, you can read this um, in their in own time, uh, and visitors are carefully ushered into a wide, onto a wide platform that hovers above the floor of the pristine cave, complete with sparkling stalagmites and stalactites. Floors littered with animal bones and bare scratched walls. The double doors close and visitors are at the first of 10 stops of a 50 minute tour. The tour, so again, you can read this in our own time. The tour has a considerable impact on many visitors, which is evident from these statements that were made after the tour. Throughout, visitor, visitor attention is directed by the guides to a series of particular features or elements, such as large red dots made by palm prints of ochre, a bear, which is the famous bear skull, placed on a large block, a unique representation of an owl on the cave wall, and more. The final two spectacular stops, which include the panel of horses and the panel of lions, are described by the guide as the beginnings of art and human visual expression. So in these uh, um, quotes, you can see all of them uh, from um, Laura's PhD research. So the statements by the visitors to Shobe 2 can be contrasted with those compared with those made in relation to another immersive rock art replica, Lascaux 2. Lascaux Cave and Lascaux 2 are both located in the Dordogne in southwest France. Lascaux Cave is situated in a hillside overlooking the Bézère Valley and the town of Montignac. The cave was discovered by four boys and their dog in September 1940, and Laura always says the dog is always mentioned as well. <laughs> and their name was Robo. So that's why the dog is in there, just because we wonder. Um, it contains over 150 paintings and 1,500 engravings distributed throughout the cave that provide sweeping, sweeping views of horses, aurochs, ibex, and deer, among others. In July 1948, Lascaux Cave was opened to the public and visitor numbers quickly grew to 1,500 to 2,000 per day. By 1960, damage to the cave was evident. Its microclimate had become disrupted by condensation, higher temperatures and increased carbon dioxide levels. Green stains caused by fungal growth along the walls had also begun to appear. And by 1962, they had developed critical levels. In 1962, the owner closed Lascaux Cave to the public and plans were made to create a faithful replica of it. <clears throat> Lascaux II opened to the public in 1983. Through 500 tons of carefully modeled concrete, meticulously sculpted surfaces and hand-painted images, Lascaux II reproduces two of the Lascaux Cave's seven sectors, the Hall of the Wolves and the Axial Gallery to within centimeter precision. A small museum precedes the replica, which is designed to provide information about Lascaux Cave archaeology and historical environment. Both sit underground in a buried complex about 300 meters from Lascaux Cave and are supported by additional facilities, including a gift shop, of course. Visitors to Lascaux II typically begin their tour soon after arriving at the site. After queuing at the undercover replica, entrance area, they are ushered down a flight of stairs and into the first of two museum chambers. It is here that the tour starts. In a group of about 20, the guide directs visitors to a map of Lastor Cave and explains that they are about to see about 90% of the paintings. 
The guide then moves visitors to a set of black and white pictures and vividly describes how four teenage boys discovered the caves together with their dog and how they, just like you in a few minutes, enter, will enter the hall of the bulls for the first time. After hearing the reasons behind shutting the cave to the public, the guide describes how the paintings inside Las Cotou were created using the same techniques and the same pigments that Cro-Magnons used. In the second museum chamber, visitors are led to more pictures of Lascaux cake, which are used to illustrate the rare use of black, red, and yellow in, rock art, in, in the rock art in the Dordogne. The guide almost whispering now says, which you see there, it is here that the guide opens up two sliding doors to the first of the replicated rock art chambers, the Hall of the Bulls. The light is low, the temperature is cool, and the guide steadily directs visitor attention from one painting to another through the careful use of a torch. After answering thoughtful questions from visitors, the guide explains that while most animals in the cave have been identified, some such as those in the unicorn panel remain a mystery. After moving into the narrow axial gallery, most visitors are forced to lean up against cold walls of the cave as the guide highlights figures of horses with small heads and large abdominals. Symbols are also illuminated by the guide who instructs the group to take a moment to appreciate the beauty of the paintings before leading them out onto a platform overlooking the woods to conclude the tour. As the visitor experience of these replicated rock art sites unfolds, the tour guides and the environment of the replica strongly mediate visitor perceptions of pastness and origins. Within the replicated immersive displays, tour guides not only become brokers of physical or emotional access, they become masters of time. At Chauvet, they evoke the notion of time travel and the cave as a place of origin. The existence of elaborate design of the replica is separated and denied at the same time or in short succession. At Lascaux too, the guide is just as influential. Visitors are ushered underground and told how they will discover the hall of the bulls for the first time. It is here that time is suspended and the pastness of the replica, or more broadly, a sense of authenticity and originality is bestowed on Lascaux too through its material connection to Lascaux Cave. The guide creates perceptions of time travel by describing the age of the Lascaux Cave's paintings and encourages visitors to place themselves in that time. The environment of the replica contributes uh, as does the visitors themselves to constructing their meanings. Visitors are made aware of the replica, but enabled, are enabled to appreciate the significance of the original at the same time. They are able to perceive the replicas as modern constructions while connecting them to the age of the original rock art. The visitor, therefore, are able to establish a connection between an origin moment in the history of humanity and their own unique existence in the present. The discovery of the Paleolithic painted caves in France and Spain continue to have a deep impact on public intellectual life far beyond the field of archaeology. It appears that the fascination of the cave has not changed or declined since the general acceptance of their antiquity about 120 years ago. The key to this fascination is obviously the notion of art and the connection to the definition of humanity itself. Stavrinaki, Maria Stavrinaki has recently discussed George Bataille's deep engagement with Lascaux Cave, which became a key aspect of his writings about anthropogenesis so it's from originally published in 1955. For Bataille, Lascaux was a miracle that didn't just break continuous time. It also contorted it enough to actualize prehistory at the heart of the present. Hence, Lascaux is the material reflection of the origins of art in the deep past. And because of its miraculous preservation, it enables the experience of this crucial moment of human becoming in the present. According to Stavrinaki, Lascaux became the beginning of art 
more or less arbitrarily because of its perfect preservation, but foremost retrospectively by pure decision of posterity. It is through these processes that elements of origins research become entangled in the processes of the creation of heritage. These are processes of the control of time, which have elsewhere been discussed as chronopolitics. These are always negotiated within dialectical relationships at individual and collective scales and involve the control of origins, the definition of authenticity. In 1973, McCannell wrote how authenticity, or more specifically, the search and desire for authenticity, shapes touristic and cultural settings and provides visitors with intimacy and a sense of belonging. The past is transformed from an inherently personal experience to one that is collective and communal and becomes a symbol of continuity and even immortality. Within these processes of collective constructions of the past, descriptions of the art inside the replicas as a beginning, however, can become problematic. When time is brought to a standstill, it can become subject to manipulation and control. When an origin is tethered to one place only, it can become exclusive and exclusionary. In future research and heritage management practices, these are key aspects that need to be critically assessed to fully understand the role of rock art in the 21st century. Thank you very much. Thank you. So I'm going to check the chat on the side here. So if anyone uh, wants to ask a question, um, from Zoom, please send a message so I can uh, open the floor to you. Is there a question from the room first? Do we still have time? Yeah, we've got plenty of time. Martin, I have a question. Well, just on that note that you finished on, does that mean in the future you and Laura will be looking at? Yeah, basically the aspects of who can actually afford to go and see these replicas. Is that what you would mean in terms of like authenticity as an exclusive experience that can only really be experienced by a certain classes of people, if you will? Mm. And does virtual reality play into that, you know, in the future when it comes to replicas? God, and so much is in that question. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so I don't know, can people hear out there? Um, that, uh, so the first question is about visitors. So is the exclusivity of that related to who can visit that? Um, to be honest, actually, I have not thought about that aspect um, because it's usually more about who has the means to build something like Trouvé 2 and, uh, and to turn that into the origin point of something. Um, and so in that sense, controls the, you know, the, the origin point. And, and as I said, I found it interesting because, um, of course, I choose the, the example um, from Germany because I'm more familiar with that, but I think that there could be something there. So there is this kind of comp potential, this competition um, going on between countries or places who can claim the origin of something, you know. So, yeah. and 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 so so in that sense, I think that's um, that, that's more what what we have in mind with that point. Um, but but of course, as always with heritage, um, is of course who can afford to go somewhere, or is it a class? Is it more of a class thing, so to speak? Um, in there, or is it is it Do made for a certain much, audience? Is it like for how much is it? Six hundred euros. Oh, that's not bad. But really, really, yeah. It's it's not the price. It's yeah, very it's cheap. Not, it's more okay. about being able to yeah, travel. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. all of people from Europe would be able to go there very easily. Mm. So, yeah. um, so, but but having said this, yes, that would probably be 
an area to explore because I think this, because I mean um, what Laura sorry I'm talking too much here, but I mean Laura um, what, what she was what my understanding of PhD was not specifically on time so to speak uh, but it's more about the experience you know mm. so I mean this is like more focus on one area and I think definitely can be expanded you know how people experience that particular aspect. So this set. I don't know if people need. So second question um, was what have we looked into? What's the time frame sort of shelf life of these replicas? Are they going to be in a hundred years time like an abandoned Disney theme park, or you know, the country's really engaged with keeping you know sort of keep, keeping those replicas? You know, because I mean they're going to require work over the years. That concrete's not going to be around forever. So yeah, is there money for that? Well, in that, that, in that sense, of course, one can then say how a replica can become an original, you know, during its lifetime. In that sense, so um, that's different. That's actually something that we would have to ask Laura. The only thing that I know is, uh, and we don't have images there. Maybe you know, but even for Lasco, because of course that was already opened the replica in the early '80s. There is no Lasco four. Yeah. Um, and uh, so I don't know, either, uh, some oh, other, I but, but then you see good, that. It's a really good question. So they're up to number four. Um, in terms of the laser imaging, you're getting the really fine incisions in the rock, which you know, there's a huge amount of information. What is cutting edge today will probably not be cutting edge in 20 years' time. Mm -hmm. So this is a really interesting essay on what statistics, what constitutes the perfect replica. Um, yeah, theoretically, it's, it's intriguing. And so they cost a lot to make. I think, I think Sholvay was about 100 million euros, but they stand to get it back in about three years because the bottom is mm -hmm. so huge. So I think related to the first uh, question by India, um, Guillaume has written a very long comment and question, but mainly it's about uh, virtual reproduction uh, yeah. as a cheaper way um, for people to access, but also what kind of, um, you know, how it can revolve with uh, actual replicas, physical ones, uh, in terms of the experience. Mm -hmm. What is your opinion about that? Oh, Guillaume, do you want to unmute yourself and actually talk, uh, ask the question properly? Now it's already been asked, but you can ask, yes, but it would be great. <laughs> or maybe why he's considering. Um, uh, th this is actually another thing that Laura and I discussed because that was one of the questions from one of the reviewers, probably Oskar. Um, so, um, and it's it's a whole it's a whole different um, um, game to be honest. Um, and uh, so, I need to think about that. I tend to think that that the whole actually, I mean, we had the 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 notion of space, you know, and of course, like you know, time, tem the temporal experience and the spatial experience are always intertwined uh, and uh, so and that of course is something that's completely removed um, completely removed in, in the digital version and also that actually like and and i think from from my understanding and again i didn't do that kind of research that laura is of course very insisting that that um, it's very important that shobe 2 is actually the, very close to where the original site is so, so that kind of thing comes really together and adds actually to the authenticity, mm -hmm. you know. So, and and then of course there are, as we know from Shuve Cave and probably Lasco, um, these kind of virtual um, um, re reproductions available already online. But of course, they, they, you know, it's hard to assess do they actually create the same kind of response. And I think uh, I doubt it. It's just different. And uh, so, as I said, but I haven't done any kind of research in this space. I I would doubt that you can replace it. I mean, there, there's a space for that. Um, there's a place for that where you can enable a certain type of um, experience, but I don't think people react will react to that in the same way because of the bodily experience and the actual sort of traveling to the site. You know? mm. So yeah. even if it's if the site is only the replica, but it's still within the same space. Yeah, and you walking know? through the images is not the yeah. same as seeing on the screen. That's yeah. Right. yeah. Um, and there's a question from Marisa as well uh, in terms of the period which is represented in the reproduction. Uh, can I create it? Yeah. Do you understand the Marisa. Really all past by colors. God, it's just a personal taste question. You know? So um, I, yeah, but, but, but I think that, that just relates to 
what is the the, the intention? I mean, it's a, of course, it's, it's actually an absolutely great question um, because, of course, when in that case um, here the the decision, and I think this is something we also haven't explored, and this what we came because we talked in this in this talk. Sorry, where I'm going. Um, so we talk in this case about two temporalities, you know. But actually, we when we when we discuss it, writing there actually far more in that one because another temporality is actually in in this case is actually the time when it was found, and so the so so the so the in in the in the experience there's this constant um, negotiation between the present that people are and marvel at what they experience then, but then they also put themselves in the time like in 1994 or 1940 when it was found. And so this is kind of the, the answer maybe to that question by actually saying this is then the experience that, that somebody wants to communicate in these replicas. It's not the experience of the Orignations or the Magdalenians. Mm -hmm. So in, in this case, it is actually more, but I said it's a bit, you know, it oscillates over there in this case. So it's actually not the, uh, an attempt to recreate, and this is, I think, what the question is from Marisa, to re recreate how it was 30,000 years ago, you know, so, but it is a more recreation how it was found in 1994 or in 1940. And, that, and that's actually a decision that, of course, you need to make. And, and the main thing that comes across to my mind is just simply the, the, the thing with the discussion about, you know, ancient Greek statues, you know, do, do you, should they be, um, um, exhibited today as painted as they were, or how they were found, and how modern, you know, the, the modernist version is actually seeing that. And uh, and by the way, sorry, but in this case, by the way, Guillaume, there's the computer <laughs> games are really great because when you because because I was no no, but I mean there's like for example in this what was it like um, Assassin's Creed Odyssey where they have recreated. Um, you know, ancient Greece, 500 or 400, you know, BC as um, the Peloponnesian War, they actually have shown everything at that time, you know, and, uh, and so, I mean, that, there's a way actually to be more flexible with that. So you can actually have that experience and that aspect within one context by saying, I want to show it like this, or I want to show it as it was, but this is a decision um, that needs to be made. Yeah. Um, I just want to tell to people online, hello, uh, that you can actually put your cameras on if you want uh, for the discussion bit, um, except if maybe I'm controlling it, just let me know. <laughs> um, but okay, there is a serious, there is a serious comment from Andrea um, about how she thinks. Yes, thank you. Um, would you like to actually make your comment online, Andrea, live? That's better. I've just had to unmute myself first. <laughs> uh, yeah, now I remember what I said. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I was just saying, I was, yeah, I just, I, I um, uh, yeah, I was, well, yeah, what I was saying was how, how can sort of being able to say, you know, I went to in this, you know, whatever site it might be, and, you know, I was actually there. Well, I went to the site, but I, you know, and I, I got to go to a visitor centre and look at a replica 500 metres away, didn't actually see it. How can that, act, that actually can't, no, that actually um, can't really compare to um, actually being able to go there and actually stand in that actual spot and see the real thing. But then on, on the other hand, I can understand why that's necessary. And, that, and at least, you know, going there and seeing the, the replica is better than going there to see whatever it was and... Uh, Oh, well, I went there to see it and it was close to the public and so I didn't see anything. <laughs> so, so, yeah, just just uh, a uh, random uh, comment, that's all. <laughs> but, but, but apparently um, that um, the, the experience or the way I understand that question or that comment is actually that, the, that this for most visitors apparently doesn't make yeah. a difference. You know, they, they actually are not complaining apparently, why can't I go into Shuve Cave? But they are really happy with the experience that they get, and and it seems to be for most people basically equivalent to uh, viewing the original. Uh, mm. and, uh, so that's kind of interesting. Also, in terms of what we sh what I showed, um, you know how mm. that is actually not the original at all. You know, so it's spatially and temporally something quite different. But in the experience, 
for the people it doesn't apparently it doesn't make a difference which one could argue is actually a, a, a bit problematic or you know is it you know so that's um, that's is again is a strategic decision that needs to be made in this context there yeah, well, I think I'd, I would probably, you know, enjoy the experience and, and have that same experience. But it would always be the thing in the, in the back of my head, probably because I think a bit differently than most that I'd sort of, you know, really like to actually see the actual thing. Yeah. 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 Well, if I may, I think it's also um, like if you're not an archaeologist, you really feel like you will never be able or allowed to go in the real place. So being yeah. able to go in a replica is already a, a really good Thing. Hello, it's me. <laughs> That's pretty much what I was trying to say, I think. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Anything more to say about this? Yeah, I, I really like your focus on the spatio-temporality. That's the thing I remember most of all. Like good music with long periods of silence, darkness, and let's, let's use the R word of revelation. And you really notice that going to the real thing. It's not just the physicality, but it's actually having no um, visual or auditory stimuli in quite a while. And then suddenly there's this extraordinary setting, and that's not captured by the replicas at all. It would be a very different kind of architecture of experience, and it may be one that people choose to do in the future. But that's what I remember most profoundly it was just, you know, even here, closing your eyes, looking out at the sound, traveling for a couple of minutes walking, moving, and then suddenly a new experience. Uh, so that, that's a fascinating component, I think, of what I've described as a kind of mm. new authenticity of art. You can see that with the impression of uh, visual illusion. Yeah, okay. do the recommenders do that? Do they do soundscapes and smellscapes? Yeah, and so I went to the I went to the Shulbe one, not the last cool one, and I, and I was in the middle of summer, so there were a lot of people every six minutes. But they did a really do good job as in terms of timing. So you didn't see the other group; you were only with your group. And also, everybody is speaking in whisper, yeah. and you're wearing these um, um, headset to hear your guide. So there is actually a lot of silence, which is a really nice um, experience to go through the cave. And the, the light also is quite well made. Um, so I thought they did a good job in terms of the sound experience. Mm -hmm. I don't know if Laura looked into that. Particularly, but I thought that was pretty good. Uh, should I say something about this? Yes. <laughs> I'm sure you can access her PhD thesis. <laughs> um, yes. Uh, well, I mean, but it's the, the thing is the thing is simply I think they you know from the vibe that I got from what from from her research is yes. So they try to recreate, but again, it's giving this illusion of. Authenticity, yeah. but it's it's not you know it's not a recreation of something original. It's 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 a, it's a modern you know recreation, and 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 then that's something of course one needs to look at um, you know how you know, what what are the strategic decisions that are being made yeah. you know, in this case. So I think that's kind of interesting. And I mean, and here is of course mostly the the um, the the focus on time, but you know it's. Um, India was saying, you know, there's sound, uh, you know, there's lighting, there's a spatial experience that are all, you know, can be looked at, um, you know, as well, of course. I said, we need to invent the holodeck. Yeah, sure, yeah. Yeah, actually, we have the trendings that we stand on. That could be a way to get around. They're walking in. That's very interesting. Yeah, there's a whole case of virtual reality. Could be cool. There's so, an element of just not that, but there's a little bit of blended reality, which does do that where you just have the classes mm -hmm. and you put the virtual reality in your space. Mm -hmm. It's a place, but they can manipulate it so you see like the color vibrance gets nice. mm -hmm. so, 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 there's actually another question from Guillaume. Yeah. So, it's, uh, it's a possibility of site replicas here in Australia. Is that something you discussed with communities around already? Is an idea at least. So I have not discussed it, but they did it themselves. Um, so and in fact, uh, just been uh, to Moranjung in the Kimberley near Derby, and they have a small museum that just opened, and they actually have a replica uh, Wanjina cave uh, in there, but um, have actually not been able to do any kind of research on this because, of course, there is actually. Quite interesting, um, you know, what, what we know from the Wanjina art 
is that there is an you know, interesting ontological dimension here because the, the Wanjula are not supposed to be paintings. So in that sense, they cannot be replicated. You know? And uh, so that would be interesting to actually ask the traditional owners how they experience um, that um, probably in the same way they experience the modern paintings of Wanjina. Uh, but of course, so that's more established in, in this kind of you know, negotiation with, with the modern understanding of paintings. Um, but um, yeah, so I mean, it's actually happening. And in this case, the one case I know that's an indigenous led um, one. So, and, uh, but yes, definitely next time I hope that maybe have some time to do that as well. And Laura would be keen if she has time and COVID permitting then this is something uh, for the future, absolutely, yeah. Okay, I think we might um, close it here, but it's almost four, but thank you everybody uh, for joining uh, in the room and uh, on Zoom, and we'll see you next week. Thank you.